Hey folks, big shout out to Dominic Eagle, the author of tonight's story. Make sure to go check out his YouTube channel called Black Volumes. He also does creepypastas and horror stories. Link will be in the description. When the etched wind came to our village, it seemed like a typical Alaskan gust, one fitting for late December. Then, as the tall tide of frost lashed against the shore of our home, the sagging branches of the yellow cedar trees stopped bouncing, and I abandoned the idea of the breeze being a breeze at all. Once others understood that, the time for running had passed. The unholy wind reached the village's main road, causing two moving cars to sharply and statically stop. The vehicles were frozen in place, much like the people within those metal graves. Onlookers enjoying a brisk afternoon in the park began to scream as loved ones succumbed to that supernatural end, imprisoned in a capsuled moment of time. Those first few victims were the lucky ones. They had been oblivious to the fate which awaited them. True terror was endured by those who beheld the raw power of the wind. Those unfortunate enough to see the end coming. Regardless, the remaining townsfolk, burdened by the awareness of impending doom, futilely attempted to escape the approaching breeze. Those fleeing residents, far slower than the unnatural frost, were halted in haunting poses as the wind bit into them. Limbs were suspended in mid-air positions, eyes were left white and unblinking, mouths were cursed to forever gape in horror. Run! Dad screamed sprinting towards us from a nearby park bench. My brother, my childhood friend and I were sitting in a sandbox, already engrossed in a fantasy world. I wondered whether my imagination had conjured the wind. I thought my mind had transcended to a higher plane. It was my way of processing the trauma. However, I accepted the reality of the situation when my father shoehorned the three of us into his Volkswagen Golf. The icy jaws of the wind were nearly nipping at the rear of the vehicle as death twisted the key in the ignition, but the beat-up car rapidly lurched forwards. My father wrenched us away from the frost, seconds before it consumed us. Daddy, where are we going? I tearfully asked. I don't know, Jillian. He weakly moaned, maneuvering around fleeing cars and pedestrians. Are we picking up mommy? Alan asked. Dad ignored my brother's question. I was only eight years old at the time, but I knew that my mother wasn't coming. I understood the significance of the tears in my father's eyes. For 26 years, I successfully managed to suppress that memory. Did such a good job, in fact, that I almost believed it had all been a dream. I started to believe that we had simply moved away from our hometown and mom had simply chosen to stay. Dad never convinced me otherwise. He never talked about what happened. Neither did my brother. As for Leon, he moved to an orphanage in Anchorage. We wrote to each other for a couple of years, but his replies became less and less frequent. Eventually, he stopped responding entirely. I used to wonder why my father didn't adopt my childhood friend, but I suppose that would have forced him to accept what happened. And, like me, he had no intention of doing that. I thought we would run back to England, having failed to achieve the American dream, but that kept us in Alaska. I assumed that he'd been driven by stubbornness, or guilt perhaps. We'd already fled our home. Perhaps fleeing across the pond would have been a step too far. Perhaps it would have felt like truly abandoning our mother. Whatever his reason for staying, Dad didn't tell anyone the truth. He never went to the police. He never returned to look for mom. Don't look back, kids. I remember him whispering as we fled the frost. I followed that advice for the next couple of decades, only recalling the event for the briefest moments from time to time. When Dad bought the first computer for our family in 2000, I googled the name of our old town. I typed the word before realizing I was even doing so. I was still young, of course, but I knew that nothing about our speedy departure had been normal. I wanted answers. I'd expected to discover that my village had become a ghost town. That would have made sense, 
Alaska's unforgiving climate breeds desolate places born to be abandoned. However, the search results revealed nothing. So I told myself I'd imagined the village. I told myself we'd always lived in Anchorage. As the years passed, I became comfortable with the notion that none of it had ever been real. Not even my mother. And that was why I did not expect to see a certain person again. Happy birthday, Jill. My jaw dropped when Leon Taylor appeared on my doorstep. It might seem strange that I would recognize a man who was a child when I last saw him, but Leon always had distinctive features. I immediately identified the mole on his neck just below his facial scruff and those sorrowful eyes shadowed by his unmistakable overgrown brows. Leon? I gasped. What are you doing here? The man smiled weakly. Sorry, Jill. I should have done this the millennial way. You know, reconnected through Facebook. No, it's... I just never thought I'd see you again. Do you want to come inside? I asked, motioning at the hallway. Leon nodded, so I made a couple of coffees whilst my old friend seated himself in the living room. A boy who I'd almost forgotten, almost entirely erased from existence, just like our old town. But I'd always known, just beneath the surface of my shallow memories, that it had all been real. The truth of my childhood was always within reach. As I brought the drinks into the lounge, hands trembling, I tried to dispel the thoughts flooding my mind. Thoughts of that awful day. How's your dad? How's Alan? Leon asked, taking the cup of coffee. I sighed. Dad's been unwell for a few years. He hasn't been taking care of himself. And he's getting old. As for Alan? Well, Alan's the way he's always been. Uptight and distant. But when was the last time you spoke to him? Leon sharply interjected. The question caught me off guard. Huh? Your brother, when was the last time you spoke to him? Leon asked. My face drained. He knows, I thought. How on earth does he know? Three years ago, I answered. My old friend nodded. Did you fall out? I scoffed. That's an understatement. You know what he was like when we were kids, don't you? Leon shrugged. He was two years older than us. We must have infuriated him. I nodded. Sure, but I grew up, and he never did. We had a big argument, and we haven't spoken since. Interesting, he responded. I raised an eyebrow. You're a man of a few words these days, Leon. The man cleared his throat. Your brother messaged me a week ago. My other eyebrow raised. What? It was a very strange message. Did you reply? I asked. I thought you would have preferred to ignore it. He lowered his head in shame. I'm sorry, Jillian. I replied to some of your letters. Then you forgot about me, I said. It's embarrassing that I didn't get the hint. It wasn't embarrassing, Leon sheepishly muttered. I read all of them, every last letter. Oh, well, that's great, I laughed. Nice to know that you cared. Chilean? I. Leon paused, lifting his head. I was scared. Scared of what? I asked. Remembering that day, he replied. It's why I told your dad I didn't want to come and live with you. It's... what? I asked. Leon tilted his head. You didn't know? Did you really think he just dumped me in that place? He might have changed, but your dad was never cold. Still, I refused. Living with you would have reminded me of what happened to my family. I didn't reply. So my old friend prodded the beast. Aren't we going to talk about why did my brother message you? I interrupted, avoiding the topic. Leon twitched his lips uncertainly, as if unwilling to part them. He told me that I had to see you. Leon trailed off. Right, I said. Why? Your brother said something insane, Jillian. He said. He claimed that Arnold Walker 
visited him in Fairbanks. My jaw fell. I beg your pardon? Arnold Walker? My brother's school friend? Leon nodded. He escaped? I didn't know others got out. I whispered. My old friend's face was growing paler. No, I... Your brother said something that seemed impossible. He said that Arnold did not arrive on his doorstep as a 36-year-old man, but a 10-year-old child. My stomach dropped. The natural response would have been to discredit such an outlandish story, refuting it with a rational explanation. But Leon's revelation served to do only one thing. It confirmed what I'd always known. A 10-year-old boy made it all the way from our hometown to Fairbanks? I asked meekly. Leon frowned. That's it? You're not going to question it? I did. I messaged Alan repeatedly, but he never replied. Not a nice feeling, is it? I asked, sighing. How did you want me to react, Leon? You were itching to talk about that day. Well, I'm not skirting around the subject now. Let's talk about it, okay? I know all of that horror really happened. I just never wanted anyone to confirm it. Me neither, Leon said. I was trying to avoid your family for the rest of my life. Your brother ruined that. Yeah, he tends to ruin things, I replied. So that's it? Alan wanted you to tell me about Arnold Walker? Leon shivered. There's more, but... Look, I know I should have messaged you about all of this first, but I thought about the way Alan avoided my questions. I didn't want you to do the same. I assumed if I were to show up in person, then I wouldn't be able to run away. I finished. I understand, Leon. I just hate that my brother is still too childish to talk to me. Funny, he called you childish too. Listening to you two bicker is nostalgic. Leon smiled before quickly adopting a solemn expression. I'm trying to change the subject, but I need to rip off the band-aid. Alan said that Arnold took him to a car on the front lawn. There was a man in the driver's seat, barely clinging to life, with a face mangled beyond recognition. Your brother said the man's skin had been peeled from his face, and he was still, somehow, alive. I shuddered, vomit climbing my throat. Arnold told your brother that the man was Mr. Johnson. Leon whispered. The farmer? The one who ran the local grocery store? I asked, shivering. My friend nodded. Yeah, Alan said he'd aged a little. Well, his hair was grayer than he remembered. The pair must have been on the road for hours, and your brother didn't know how they knew where to find him. He had so many questions for them. But Mr. Johnson died before the ambulance arrived, and whilst Alan talked to the paramedics, Arnold ran away. He's missing. Shit, I whispered. I'll call my brother. You might struggle, Leon said. Alan ended the message by saying that he was going back. Home. I copped. No, he wouldn't be that stupid. Maybe not. You should try to contact him, Leon said. He hasn't replied to my dozens of messages, but he might reply to you. Not sure he even has a signal out there in the boonies, but you're right, you should try. I spent an hour trying to contact my brother in various ways, but he did not respond. Alan had vanished, and I knew, like it or not, that I had to return to our village too. I should have told Dad, would have told him had he not been one bad day away from a heart attack. In spite of the man he'd become, I loved him. I didn't want to remind him of the place we'd fled. One person should be spared of the horror of remembering, I thought. Leon and I, two strangers who spent formative years together, piled into my Kia, and we drove from Anchorage to a place that I'd long hoped had never really existed. I was going to be horribly disappointed. On a nondescript road that burrowed into the Alaskan wilderness, my throat started to twist and constrict. The outer edge of my vision shrank and my head pulsated with a slowing rhythm. As the world slipped away from me, I struggled to breathe as I came to terms with an awful fact. I recognized that endless road. Jillian? Leon whispered. Don't. 
I begged. I didn't want to hear it. I wasn't ready. I'd known all along, of course, that our village existed, even when extensive research had revealed nothing about the town. When I thought of the way the breeze consumed the town, erasing its residents, it made sense that it would erase the very place itself. After all, even I'd started to doubt its existence, and I had lived there. Accepting the unearthly nature of the event wasn't as tough as you might imagine. If anything, I had fought hard to deny it. I wanted to ignore the existence of a paranormal force, though I had witnessed it with my own eyes. Even if there were some Alaskan breeze powerful enough to instantaneously freeze an entire town, we hadn't witnessed that. We'd seen something else. We'd seen that glacial wind freeze the town, not its people, but its tether to time. After an hour of following the frosted landscape, we saw something familiar on the horizon. Leon's face mirrored mine as our damned village appeared, a bulge of ruin and decay growing as we neared it. And when we crossed the threshold into the desolate town, the reality of our quest finally dawned on me. Where is everybody? Leon asked. It might seem a moronic question to an outsider. Our old village was clearly an abandoned place. No rational person would expect anybody else to be there. Of course, I understood Leon. He had asked the same terrifying question that was circling the drain of my mind, refusing to flush away. I thought back to that terrible day on which hundreds of people froze in time. Then I thought of Arnold Walker and Mr. Johnson, the two residents who had supposedly shown up at my brother's door. One of them had looked no older than he had been in 1998. Time resumed. I finally mumbled. Yes, but where did everybody go? My childhood friend asked. I didn't have an answer. Neither did my brother. And that was why he had come here. That's not the real reason, I thought. He was hoping to find... Her... I rolled onto my old street, noting that the trees swayed in the wind and birds flew overhead, signs that time was flowing. I wondered whether others had fled in the same fashion as Arnold and Mr. Johnson. I even allowed my heart to soar a little as I considered that my mother might have freed herself, might have found Dad in Anchorage, might be wondering where Ellen and I had gone. However, I knew that not to be the case. Mom had not arrived at my door, and there had been no national news coverage about people emerging from a town that didn't exist. There had only been an old, half-butchered man and a quiet boy. Both were gone. And I had questions about the nature of their escape from our hometown, given my brother's ominous message to Leon. Something was still dreadfully wrong with our village. Twenty-six years had not changed that. The people of the village had not disappeared into the sunset. Whatever had happened to them, I knew it wasn't good. Possibly worse than what happened to Arnold Walker and Mr. Johnson. I pulled onto the driveway of my childhood home, gently trundling over cracked asphalt. Weeds squirmed through the wounds of the suburb as nature sought to erase my childhood from existence. There was no need for that, of course. The wind of 1998 and whatever secrets it held had already done a fine job of wiping my hometown from reality. Do you think he's come here? Leon asked as I turned off the engine. Yes, we both know who he wanted to find, I said. My childhood friend nodded, and we both somberly climbed out of the vehicle. The village was colder than I remembered. From mid-afternoon day in late May, it was unseasonably chilly. Alaska, for the most part, is not the Arctic hellscape that many people imagine. Not in all parts of the state, anyhow, and certainly not in late spring. The air also felt stale. It carried the stench of evil, and it seemed to be tinged with frost, as if that demonic breeze were still lingering in the air nearly three decades later. I knocked on the rotten front door, surprised that it didn't break with a slight rap of my hand. Alan? I yelled. It's Jillian! My brother did not respond, but I wasn't concerned. If he had been there and mom hadn't, then he wouldn't have wanted to stay. I wanted to use that as an excuse to turn around and leave. I already assumed that my mother wouldn't be there. 
But another part of me knew is that my assumption was more of a wish. In a similar way, I had been secretly glad to find nobody in the town. There was only one person I hoped to find in my old village, and that was Alan. I was terrified by the prospect of finding anything else. Jill, Leon started softly. Come on, we have to do it. Do we? I asked. This was a mistake. We should turn around. We- I agree. Leon sharply interjected. But we have to find your brother, and when we do, we'll convince him to come back with us. We'll convince him to leave this place behind too. Why did you come to see me, Leon? I asked. You could have ignored my brother's message. You could have pretended none of this had ever happened. That's what you did when you started ignoring my letters, isn't it? I deeply regretted that for years, Jill. He said softly. You were my best friend. You were... More than that, we were just kids, but I loved you. I've not made another connection like ours, not even in my adult life. I know, I replied. I loved you too, Leon. That's why it hurt when you let our bond peter out. If you'd cut me off from the start, I would have understood. But it just felt like you stopped caring. Never. I just lost the strength to bear that trauma, he explained. Every letter was a reminder, and I just... That's why I came to your door. That's why I didn't ignore what your brother said. I didn't want something to happen to him. You lost your mother. I didn't want you to lose him too. We all lost things, I sniffled. You lost more than me. I just don't understand why you'd come back. Why my brother would come back. I don't even understand why I've come back. We never really left this place, did we? Leon asked. Not in our minds, even though it doesn't exist in the eyes of the outside world. It never left us, never let go. Arnold Walker and Mr. Johnson lured Alan back, and he lured us back. That's an unsettling way of looking at it, I timidly replied. It's the only way I've been able to look at it, he said. Whatever claimed this place, it remembered us, and it made sure we remembered it. Not that it would be easy to forget. For years, I thought I'd lost my mind. But after talking to you and Alan, I'm not so sure. I find it hard to believe that we'd have experienced a shared delusion. No, it all really happened, and the memory replays in my mind every day. I'll never get rid of it. Dad seemed to do a good job of erasing this place from his mind, I said. I knew that wasn't true, of course. He had never forgotten. That was made apparent by his deterioration. Alan and I had a close relationship with our father before we left that village. Afterwards, he changed. We all changed. Losing mom had fractured the family. But there was more to it than that. I started to consider that Leon might be right. Perhaps the frost hadn't ensnared the two of us. But it had certainly bitten us. Do you want me to do it? Leon eventually asked. I wanted to be courageous enough to open the door. But I wasn't. I nodded meekly and stepped aside, allowing my childhood friend the nightmarish task of facing whatever lay within my old home. He pushed the door handle down, expecting the house to be unlocked. But it wouldn't budge. Shall we try the back? I asked. Leon backed up. I quickly realized what he was planning to do, and I opened my mouth to utter a protest. My hulking friend had charged before I spoke a single word, however and he hurled his body into the door. It quivered in its frame, but did not give. Leon? I cried. What are you doing? Well, I don't suppose you have the key? He panted, massaging his shoulder. I held up my hands. Look, let's just... My friend rushed forwards again, and the result was the same. This time, however, Leon released a groan of pain, clutching his arm a little more tightly. You're going to hurt yourself. I said. Let's take it in turns to kick the door. That'll work better, and it won't cripple either of us. Leon nodded, and the two of us firmly booted the door near the handle. The wood quaked, and it only took a few attacks for the door to splinter around the lock. The frame splayed inwards, and the metal mechanism fell loose. Whoops, that worked a little too well. Leon laughed. He led the way into my childhood home, which looked... Unlike the street outside, the same as I remembered. The same as it had looked 
on the day I'd left. There were no shoes left by the door, no muddy prints on the carpet, no indication whatsoever that my brother had visited our old home, which I'd garnered when the front door had been locked. But this was not a relief. I knew in my gut that Alan would have gone there first. He never made it home. Leon shivered. This place feels cold. Frozen, I corrected. Frozen in time. Is it safe for us to be here? He asked. What if we end up like the others? It's a bit late to ask that now, I replied. The breeze passed long ago. This just seems to be the horror it left behind. Leon accepted my suggestion. Then he wandered over to the staircase. My friend took one step before halting in place. For a hunting moment, I believed that he had been frozen in time too. I believed that I'd been wrong and the frost had come for us. But I quickly realized that my friend was still moving, still twitching. He was frozen by fear, not a supernatural gale. There's someone in the bathroom, Leon wheezed. With physical dread in every inch of my body, I joined my friend and looked up. Artificial light spilled beneath the bathroom door onto the dark landing. There might not be anyone in there, I shakily said. Jillian, this is an abandoned town. There is no electricity. Your house is still frozen in time, and it froze with the bathroom light left on. Somebody must have been. Don't say it, I pleaded, upper lip trembling. Do you want me to lead the way? He asked. I didn't. I wanted to run. But I knew I would never forgive myself for doing so. Leon was right, of course. I hadn't allowed him to finish a sentence, but it was clear that he was going to mention somebody in particular. Somebody whose face flooded my mind as we ascended the staircase, one tentative step at a time. Somebody whose name started to tickle my lips as Leon grasped the handle to the door. It wasn't locked. Mom? I moaned as Leon inched it open. My ageless mother was inside. I'm sure I would have screamed at whatever we found, but I was not prepared for the state of the statue before me. Mom was standing at the sink, hands cupped below a stream of tap water suspended in time. As I had always feared, the frost caught her. It was horrifying enough to be frozen in time for 26 years whilst the rest of the world continued. But that wasn't why I screamed. I had praised myself for that possibility. I'd spent my entire adult life coming to terms with it. I screamed because I wasn't prepared to see her face. Mom was smiling. Not a wholesome smile. It was a taut grin that etched an unnerving crescent shape across her cheeks. There was nothing unnatural about the grin, but it looked painful and it appeared as if cataracts had taken the entirety of her pupils. Mom? I asked weakly. Do you hear me? There was no reply. I peered around the side of her face, and I immediately regretted it. Though she was frozen in time, she did not look unaware. I felt her sightless eyes boring into my face, and I quickly jumped backwards. Let's go and find your brother, Leon fearfully said. As I nodded, Backing towards the doorway, I locked my gaze onto my mother's profile. My heart pounded as I started to close the bathroom door. I was trying to ignore the idea that had warmed into my mind. The possibility that behind the glassy cataract, a pupil might still exist, lying dormant, watching me from a face that no longer seemed to belong to my mother. After I shut the door, Leon and I took a few moments to control our breathing. With a slight tremble, my friend finally walked over to the light switch and raised a hand, but I caught his wrist. What are you doing? He frowned. Leave the light on, I whispered. I don't like the idea of leaving her in the dark. My friend's expression softened, and he nodded, seeming to understand my explanation, seeming to empathize, but I was lying. I wasn't worried about leaving my mother in the dark. I was worried about the thing behind that smiling face. Alan didn't come here, I said. Did he really come back? You read the message, Jillian, Leon replied. I know, but I sighed. I know. 
he might not have come to the house, my friend suggested. This is the first place he would have visited, I said. If mom wasn't here, he wouldn't have returned. Well, let's look around, Leon urged. You never know, we might find something else, something to help your mother perhaps. You saw her face, I whispered. She looked far past help. Don't say that, Jillian, Leon shouted, eyes watering. You idiot, I thought. I was so self-centered, so focused on finding my brother and my mother. I hadn't thought about Leon's parents, his brother Carl, people we'd left behind when my father saved us. I remembered Leon sobbing as he begged my father to turn around. I'm sorry, I said. We need to find your family too. Leon viciously shook his head. Only if we find an answer, Jill. Only if we find a way to save them. My friend entered my childhood bedroom, and I followed him. I imagine that visiting one's childhood home is a strange experience for anyone, but strangeness morphs into horror when that home is trapped in a moment of time. I felt physically unwell when I saw the glass of water on the bedside table, fresh as it had been on the day that my dad took us to the park. Life had continued for me, but the town was still trapped in that dreadful, inexplicable day. Jillian? Leon said calmly. There are people outside. He was standing in the front of my bedroom window, and when I joined them, eyeing the road below, I saw them. A man and a woman who seemed to be in their mid-forties. The men wore ill-fitting clothes, a checkered shirt two sizes too small, and a pair of torn jeans. The woman, on the other hand, wore a pristine, shapely dress with a floral pattern. She looked oddly familiar, though her eyes were jittery and unfocused. It was the man who'd locked his eyes onto our house. I vaguely recognize her, Leon said. I nodded. Yeah, I don't know her name, but I remember her. She looks a tad older, perhaps. I don't know the man, though. You stay here, Leon said reaching inside his coat. Don't come out. What are you holding? I frowned, noting his shiftiness. Just. Leon concealed his hand within the thick, wintry coat. Are you going to stay in here? My eyes grew as I spotted a glint of metal. You don't. No, Leon. Please, don't tell me you have what I think you have. We had no idea what we were going to find here. The man protested. I scoffed. Leon Taylor? Carrying a gun? The boy who berated me for killing me a spider? Before he replied, there came the sound of the front door swinging open, and when we spun our heads back to the bedroom window, we saw that the man and woman were no longer on the street. I realized they were inside. Hello? Called the man from downstairs. We mean you no harm. I have a weapon. Leon yelled, slipping the pistol out of a hidden holster. Don't shoot. It's Bernie Bradley. The man shouted weakly. My mouth gaped. Bernie Bradley was in my brother's school year. I remember them. And as I recalled the face of the man I'd seen on the street, I didn't find it hard to believe it had been the face of that same boy 26 years into the future. What do you want? I yelled. To help you, he replied. Before they come. Who? Leon asked. I'll tell you if you put that weapon away, Bernie said. I don't trust you enough for that, my friend growled. Are you Leon Taylor? The man asked. Why? Leon responded. Sydney Manley pushed you off the swing set and you called her a fat cow, Bernie said. She ran home in tears. It wasn't enough. In a place like that, which defied all laws of rationality, it wasn't enough for Bernie Bradley to know that. But Leon and I needed it to be enough. Because we were hopelessly alone, hopelessly afraid, and hopelessly desperate. My friend reholstered his weapon, and we walked onto the landing. Bernie and the woman were midway up the stairs. The man's hands were raised, but the woman barely seemed aware of where they were, barely seemed aware of herself. Leon Taylor and Jillian Maynard, is that right? Bernie asked. How did you recognize us? I asked. You were the only ones who escaped, he replied. The Maynards and Leon Taylor. The only ones? Leon asked incredulously. Bernie nodded. Others tried, but the frost got them. 
So, why aren't you? I started, unable to finish. Mind if we sit down before I answer that? He asked. I looked at Leon, and my friend begrudgingly nodded. We all headed to the living room and sat down. Once we did, Bernie Bradley told us an incredible story, and the woman beside him simply rocked on the sofa, face painted with a disturbing smile. Bernie had been a ten-year-old boy sitting at his bedroom desk when the chill swept through his room. He told us that he remembered nothing but a black void. He might have been there for an eternity, or it might have been less than a moment. When he woke from that dark slumber, still a ten-year-old boy sitting in the desk chair, Bernie looked out of the bedroom window. He was overcome by the horrible feeling that time had been lost, but he didn't know how much. And when he saw residents frozen in the street, he realized that something awful had happened. Bernie found his own past parents in the kitchen, and they were completely unresponsive to his pleas. The lonely, frightened boy ran through the town, calling for help. Nobody answered. After a long day of searching, he returned to his house in tears. For a week, Bernie lived on cans of food from the cupboards. And then, he heard shouting from the street. Hello? Is anybody there? A man called. Bernie ran outside to find Mr. Johnson. The farmer had just woken from a darkness to find a town full of statues. Bernie told Mr. Johnson that he'd been alone for a week, but he had no idea how long he'd been frozen before that. The boy wanted to leave, but the farmer said they had to save as many people as possible. They had a duty to do so. After all, neither the farmer nor the boy knew what might happen to them if they were to run. The frost might return. Anyway, Mr. Johnson took Bernie under his wing. The crops in his field, thankfully, had unfrozen, as had his entire farmhouse. Mr. Johnson fed Bernie, and the two of them survived. A week later, they found Elizabeth Coulter, the local head teacher, wandering through the town. Over the course of the following year, a dozen more unfrozen souls were saved and brought back to Mr. Johnson's farm. But things changed as time passed. The newer thought souls were unhinged. The longer a person had been trapped in that black stasis, the less human they became. They were still intelligible, but they spoke only of the voice in the void. A voice that they missed in the land of the living. They were irritable, but Mr. Johnson cared for them all the same. Eventually, they fled. This only worsened as the years went by. After a decade, Bernie's mother and father unfroze. However, his dad ran and his mom only remained because she was lost and confused. She would rant and rave about the speaker, the one that would make everything better, the one that would make them all eternal. It was during the year of 2018 that things crossed a terrifying line. Mr. Johnson had decided that newcomers were not welcome. It was a decision of necessity, not cruelty. The recently unfrozen folk had become more than unintelligible. They had become dangerous. Hark! The speaker calls! Walter Frankton screamed. The middle-aged man, who had once been a police officer, was standing outside Mr. Johnson's farmhouse. When the community of sane people emerged, they screeched at the sight of Walter holding a charred body above his head. Nobody identified the burnt corpse. But Mr. Johnson wasted no time in drawing his rifle and giving Mr. Frankton 10 seconds to flee. Bernie explained that Walter left demonically before disappearing into the night. Over the coming years, bodies were found in the street. Followers of the speaker would relentlessly pursue Mr. Johnson's community. So, the sane folk kept distant from the people of the speaker. Few of Mr. Johnson's followers understood why they stayed. Yet, nobody felt able to leave. Something was keeping them there. A couple weeks before Leon and I arrived, however, Bernie said that Mr. Johnson finally announced his plan to leave. There were murmurs of uncertainty. Everybody wanted to escape, of course, but fear had always stopped them. Still, they trusted Mr. Johnson. If anybody had the power to safely lead them away from the place controlling their minds, it had to be the brave farmer. Packing and preparations began. However, some days later, Bernie Bradley happened to look out of an upstairs window and noticed Mr. Johnson. 
The old man was wandering aimlessly onto the driveway, stumbling like a drunken man towards his vehicle. Bernie said there was a small child standing beside the car. The young boy led Mr. Johnson to the driver's door with a smile, and the two of them fled. Things disintegrated after that. When a Molotov cocktail found its way through a window, the community dispersed. The sane folk fled in different directions, and Bernie was left alone with his mother. We'd been running for days, Bernie explained. I keep finding the bodies of people from my community, charred corpses in the street. I tried to leave this town, but it wouldn't let me. The farther I drove, the sharper the pang in my heart. I knew I'd die if I were to keep going. How did you find us? Leon asked. I heard you, Bernie replied. Hard to miss the sound of an engine in a dead place like this. I had a hunch that it might be you. You must have heard my brother then, I asked, hopefully. Bernie frowned. Alan's here? That might explain the ruckus a few days ago. I don't know what I heard. Noise. Lots of it. You won't find him, Jill. You have to run whilst it still lets you. The frost might be gone, but something lingers. The speaker? Leon asked. Bernie nodded. I was fortunate enough to never hear it. Or never remember hearing it. I don't know what it said to them. My mother won't tell me. Bernie looked to the woman next to him. The one who appeared to be the same age as him. Though I realized he was still a decade younger. The horror of our town had aged him beyond his years. It will be so glorious. Bernie's mother giggled. Eyes bearing faint pupils behind mild cataracts. You're lucky that he didn't see you arrive. Bernie said. Otherwise, you'd be dead already. But they'll come, sooner or later. And you need to listen to me if you want a safe way out of here, okay? We need to distract them, keep them off your backs. I shook my head. I need to find my brother. I know he came to this town. I thought I'd find him in our home, but... Walter wanted him. Bernie's mother hissed. The woman stopped rocking, stopped smiling, and her head snapped to face me with such eerie speed that I thought it might entirely disconnect from her neck. Bernie quivered, seemingly just as horrified by his mother's words as the rest of us. Mother? He asked. Walter wanted him. Walter wanted him. Walter wanted him. The woman laughing, taunting me. What does she mean? I sobbed. Does Walter Frankton have my brother? Bernie's face whitened. If he does, your brother's either been flayed or charred. Christ, Bernie, Leon replied. I sniffled. I won't leave until I know. He's already dead, Bernie bluntly said. We don't know that, I cried. I thought the others were sitting in stunned silence because I'd spoken so assertively. However, as I calmed my breathing and the throbbing sensation in my ears quietened, I heard it too. The sound of laughing voices. Bernie's mother strained to smile broadly. She looked as pained as my mother, but grateful for the privilege of the discomfort. You don't want to see this. We'll head through the back. Do not look at the street. Bernie hoarsely pleaded as I rose, but I was already running to the door. I flung it open and started to run down the path with Leon and Bernie in tow. Then, my eyes met the mop, spilling beyond the end of the street. The crowd easily numbered a hundred people, and each face wore a terrible smile. Eyes glassy, yet all-seeing. There was a man shuffling from the crowd towards me, like a terrified toddler taking its first steps. I tried to blot his face from my mind. I didn't want to see it, though it was too late for that. I'd seen everything the moment I faced the crowd. Eventually, I fell to my knees and howled as I embraced the truth. The shuffling man who had been flayed alive, was my brother. Alan reached towards me with an outstretched hand, weakly shouting something before toppling forwards. He was reduced to a motionless heap on the road. Jill! Leon cried again, rushing to me. We have to go! I continued to wail as the gleeful crowd surged forwards. I resisted Leon, but he easily hauled my limp body to the car and bundled me into the back. He needs help, I blubbered. He's gone, Jill, Leon whispered. 
What about your family? I asked. They're all gone, he sniffled, stepping on the accelerator. Staring through the rearview window, I watched the crowd approach my old home. Bernie stood on the front porch, and his mother had her hands on his shoulders. The man did not run. As we pulled off the driveway, it almost seemed as if he too finally had a smile on his face. The mop swarmed Bernie, and I heard a brief cry of agony. It may have been ecstatic, or fearful. It may have been both. After we crossed the border, no chill pierced us. We were free to leave, but I know Leon and I belong to that town. I have always suspected that the wind greased its teeth against my skin when I was a child. It greased all of us, for even now, I still feel that link, that urge to return to the salivating mop with a smile on my face. When I returned home, to find that my father was missing. I knew. He felt it too.